Okay, let's let's jump. Let's jump let's in. Go, go ahead, let's Wembley. go. All right, I will kick it off. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Generation the Podcast, the audio companion to the HBO Max original series, Generation. I'm Wembley Sewell, editor in chief of them. Yes, and I am Gigi Good. Just a drag queen. Today, we are talking to Shar White, who wrote this episode. And I am so excited. We are going to be talking to Ms. Martha Plimpton. Ms. Plimpton, if you're nasty, who stars as Nathan and Naomi's mother. Also, Ms. Zelda Barnes, creator of Generation, is back with us today. Before we get into all of this um, good meat we got to get into, Wembley, let's talk about episode four. Tasty. Well, I mean, <laughs> this this was a big one for me. Yeah. The reality is, whether you believe it or not, I come from quite a conservative family. You're just going to have to trust me on that one. And it was kind of fascinating for me to see conversations about identity happen from the perspective of parents. Like, I'm so used to, like, having it in my own circles amongst my own chosen family. But, like, to see, you know, this process being shown from the perspective of a parent was really, really, um, again, like I said, fascinating. I think it was really beautiful how it centered Megan's point of view. Complex, of course. I just think we kind of were taken on that ride of her grappling with with everything that happened. Needless to say, I'm excited to jump right in. Yeah, I mean... We've gotten to know Martha Plimpton's character, Megan, a little bit up until now. She's been in here, um, you know, here and there. She's got her meticulous family calendar with, of course, the purple dot for the days that she'll be having sex with her husband, who is played by Sam Trammell. She's a bit of the mother of the bridezilla at her daughter's wedding, which is very clear, very apparent from the jump. But in this episode, we go a little bit deeper with her. So we are so happy to have Martha here. And I... I, Martha, I'm such a big fan of your work. I just like the Goonies is one of my favorite. We can get into that later, but I just... Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you guys. Yes. I want to cue up a clip because I think it really kind of paints it perfectly because Megan, as a mother to Nathan and Naomi, just seems to be one, and I'm saying this with as much as a soft spot as I can, that completely rejects or just like fails to acknowledge reality sometimes of what's going on inside her family. So last episode, we talked a lot about Nathan Spig coming out and, of course, jumping off of the boat. And here's a recap of how his family responded. Let's give them something to talk about. Okay, but they're also literally not talking at all. Wait, I don't understand. Like, you came out, you jumped off a boat, like, nobody's saying anything? Yeah, no. My mom is just like, oh, hi, everything's going down. Is she going to freak? Probably. Do you want me to stop? Uh, you jump, I jump, right? Oh my God. Exhale. So, Martha, I need, I just absolutely need to hear your point of view. Why do you think your character is, is pretending it didn't happen? Like, what is going on there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> pretending it didn't happen. So let's talk about Megan just on broad strokes, yes, yes. right? So she's... She's a conservative woman, but primarily she's an evangelical sort of gospel of prosperity. You know, the that big church in Orange County. What's what it what is it that oh forget it. I'm I'm drawing a blank. We don't we don't claim yeah, some, yeah, yeah. some mega church. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like a big mega church. And um and you know, Orange County actually is home to more mega churches than any other county in this country. So this is where she comes from. She's also got these friends, right? Patrick and Joe. Now, Patrick, you know, from Megan's perspective, didn't used to be gay, but, uh, you know, he has come out and Megan, you know, was supportive of him. She was there for him when he came out. But that's a very different thing for Megan than when it happens in her family. I imagine she's had like their whole life plan mapped out and is very much about things going according to schedule and according to plan. Naturally, her teenagers are growing up. They're soon going to be out of the house, but they've already sort of emotionally left her. So the, the, the natural way that teens, of course, have to rebel and have to, you know, create their own identities is happening way too fast for Megan. 
I'm sorry about my dogs, you guys, but this is just. Um, and then her son is uh, coming out as bisexual, which for Megan, that's not a thing that exists. You don't get to pick and choose, right? In her mind, that's what bisexuality means, right? So she sees this as a phase. She sees this as an act of rebellion to irritate her, to hurt her. And so she just wants to treat it like it's going to go away. And the fact that it doesn't, and it just keeps coming back is really a problem for her. <laughs> <laughs> she can't um, take it. Yeah, she really can't take it at all. And also just as a mother, she's also dealing with the reality that she's going to they're going to leave her soon as I said before, she's going to have this empty nest situation. Just fundamentally any mother would have problems with that, particularly a, a mom who is a stay-at-home mom whose sole focus and sole concentration is on her family and on her kids. And what does she do when that's over, when they go? Who is she? Who, what's her, what is she supposed to be like? Is, is she just going to be stuck with her husband the whole, you know? That's like, a tough, tough pill to swallow, for sure. Exactly. As a, as a mother. And this is... This spoke to me a lot, this whole storyline, because this is exactly how my dad was with me when I was coming out and that he had like his brother is gay and that was his only window into gay culture. And of course, he had to accept it because it was his brother. But as soon as the, the script flipped and it, it happened to one of his own, he did. He just didn't know how to handle it. So it was just like a denial, denial, denial. So something I like seeing in this particular storyline is when it comes to, you know, my experience, it's usually the mom who is on the side of, of the child and the dad who is dealing with that sort of denial and, and unacceptance. But I, I like the reversal of this because you have Sam who plays this like clueless sort of dad who's just like wants to be on everyone's side. But Martha, I'm curious when you first read this role, what made you want to play this character who's very different than your past roles? <laughs> I'll tell you that that all I knew of her was the first episode, which I thought was very funny. And then I spoke with Zelda and Daniel, and we just talked about the script and we talked about some of their ideas of where she might end up going. I took a bit of a leap of faith based on that because it was really more about the script in general, the script as a whole that I really wanted to be a part of. I hadn't ever read anything like it or anything that was structured like it before. And I also certainly felt it was a completely new take, this story or you know stories like this, because it came from Zelda and of course from Daniel too. But but it was Zelda, Zelda's experience as a young person, you know, that just made it feel so much more authentic and so much more honest. And I wanted to uh, be a part of that. Zelda, to me, I'm curious what, what you were thinking, like, as you were kind of shaping not only, you know, this character, but shaping um, the relationship that her two children would have to her. Were there any thoughts that you, like any, any thoughts you have kind of in terms of that building that dynamic? Since the show came out, I've had so many like friends, parents reach out to me to say like, I think I might be a little bit more like Megan than I realized. That's exactly the dialogue that we kind of want to start with the show is like people realizing that they have these inherent biases against specifically bisexuality. A lot of parents have been saying things like, I also kind of didn't really think bi was real. And it's just, it's funny that this show was kind of starting that conversation, definitely. We were playing around with this idea of this woman who like runs her family and is pretty controlling of her whole family. Like she always kind of wants to control everything. And we see that also with her oldest daughter's wedding. She just like plans the whole wedding and she needs it to go exactly how she wants to go. And she has this big calendar where she plans out everything that happens. She's just focused on like maintaining an image to the outside world. She is really trying hard to maintain some semblance of control over them in a way. And they are really starting to like not have it anymore. Well, the one thing I will say kind of going off of that is, I mean, this whole show is tied inherently to identity and the exploration of it. And obviously so much of that is inextricably linked to queerness. But I think when you look at Megan, a lot of her identity, like like you all have said, is wrapped up in being so controlling and so uptight. And it's a little bit thrilling, I have to say, to watch 
someone we've come to know as that begin to break in this kind of frenetic way? And so this question is a bit of a two-parter. Martha, I'd love to know how you navigate this beginning of this break as an actor and then, you know, Shar, how, how you begin to write that as well. I want to let Shar start. Oh, <laughs> look, I, I mean, I just, I, I, I love this character so much. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, the idea of writing for Martha is such a treat because you know she can take any nuance and contradiction and, and really bring it to life. Martha's been such a joy all season at the monitors watching you continue to just deliver these like unbelievable arias, you know, throughout throughout the season. But for me, I think, you know, we did a lot of discussion in the room about Megan's essence, her conflict. She has a conflict that will never be solved um, in regards to her sexuality. And, and th- I think it's something that compromises her on such a bone-deep level. No matter how much she loves her children, no matter how much she loves Nathan, she also has this deeply felt, ingrained Christianity which she will never talk about, is that she's really afraid her son is going to go to hell. And I feel like so much of our writing with Megan in her conversations with Nathan are circling this idea. You know, it's something that's always top of mind. There's a real kind of desperation to keep him from hell. At the same time, wanting to be accepted by him, wanted wanting to be loved by him, wanting to show him this love. And yet, like, if this is articulated, this will ruin the relationship. You know, so there's this conflict is something that she's never really going to be able to fully come out with. And that's the the fulcrum, I think, that that she sort of mm-hmm. spins around and around and around throughout this entire throughout this this entire series. Spinning, spiraling, just full meltdown all the time. And it's like, I think something that's so important to realize is that more often than not, it has less to do with what this person, this parent, this mother, what her values really are, and more so to do with how she was raised and how it's so ingrained into her mind. Like, it's just not that easy for her to just like flip and change and just be like, oh, okay, I can accept this. It's what everyone's doing because it's not what she grew up on. So it takes a lot more than that. And I have a feeling there's going to be a bit of an arc around that as we continue watching. Shar, I want to know more about your process in writing for television coming from the background that you have writing more so for stage writing. And the same for you, Martha, because you have experience on stage. You know, I mean, I think the great thing about television right now is that there is, it's, it is so different than TV, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. So it's, it's a delightful world to be working in. Ultimately, I'm a structuralist. Uh, You know, I, I really feel the sort of the unwinding of the acts. I really love to see a brilliant performer on an incredible aria. And I think I think that's been the joy of of writing Megan, especially. And there's so much about this show that is about structure and is about this puzzle making. And the delight in in being on the show for me is is really figuring out those puzzles, which which I love. Yeah. Just on the micro level, I mean, Megan is not terribly articulate. She doesn't really have the words for how she feels. And so subsequently, her rhythms are a little bit funky. Her syntax is a little bit funky. That's something that that I've learned I really had to concentrate on because the way she says things and the way I say them are very, very different. It's hard to make someone talking badly or expressing themselves badly, it's very hard to internalize that and and make it work seamlessly. So I, I find myself actually spending an enormous amount of time just on the lines, just on learning the lines. Yeah. Because even when I learn them, uh, the, the, I find that I've switched things around or I've made them sound like me living inside of her in that way that I found not only challenging, but exciting, invigorating. And then there's this this stuff about her aria, as Char puts it, or her arc. In many ways, the show is completely unconventional. And I think one of the ways in which it's unconventional is that we really, I don't feel we're sending a message or we're teaching a lesson. What we're really doing is showing the experience of going through this. We're showing the minute by minute moment by moment experience 
of what it's like to come to terms with these things. And it doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen the way it normally happens on television. It, it's things get stuck. People get stuck and people repeat themselves and people go back over something again, you know, in a subsequent episode or they try and, you know, they try and get it right this time. Maybe if I say it right this time, it'll make a difference. Do you know what I mean? So it, it, it doesn't, that's one of the things I also like about it. It doesn't have this beginning, middle and end, A, B, C, D, and then we end at Z, you know, it's stops and starts. It's you know, negotiating, fighting, coming back at it from maybe a different angle. Maybe this angle will work, you know. That's the journey I see Megan on. And I don't know if we're going to see her make this marvelous grand gesture, but I think we will see her get deeper into the weeds. We're talking about episode four of the HBO Max series, Generation. And we're going to get into a lot more after a quick break. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. We're talking to Generation creator Zelda Barnes, series writer Shar White, and Martha Plimpton, who stars as Megan. I imagine, too, you know, Martha, for you, is it like, you know, Megan is a character who sort of, she kind of skims over the surface of what she means. Do you know? That's like she right. just, yes, she can't yes. go, she can't go deeper or the, the real truth will all come out. And so I, exactly. mean, I imagine building all of the internal monologue that's behind the external monologue takes takes right. an extraordinary yes. amount of work. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It does. There's still a bit of self-awareness there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or self, even self hindrance. Like, I feel like you can mm -hmm. feel, you know, everything she wants to be saying at the surface mm -hmm. of, of all of the frustration or, you know, outbursts or, or you know, again, the, the moment in the room with the snacks, which we'll get to later. Like, there's right. so much underneath the surface. And one of the things that, that I really felt was that there was still a beauty in the flaws, even though, you know, Thinking about this character, I could see how it mirrored my own life and that own pain and that own struggle and wishing that, you know, your parent could be something else in one particular moment or not knowing exactly what they're saying behind your back while you're listening in another room or anything like that. There was still so much beauty in the flaws. And I would love to know kind of from all of you, like, as you were crafting these imperfections of this character, how did you write her, act her, perform her in a way that people could still, you know, relate to and empathize with knowing that, again, those flaws existed and were very real and, and are hard to get across on screen, especially today. I think the most important thing to remember about Megan, honestly, is that she really loves her kids. And that's, it's just scary for her to see, like, change. I think she is a woman who's very afraid of change. Almost everything she does is motivated by her fear of change and her love of her children. That's kind of her motivation to keep remaining in denial and keep kind of fighting him on it, even when ultimately it's very difficult to deny. <laughs> Yeah, and we, I mean, we really, we really spent a lot of time in the room too, right, Zelda? Um, um, struggling against judging her and being judgmental of her. And I think, I think the more we delved into her fear and her sense of loss and, and also this sort of, this earth shattering loss for her, which is she had planned out this perfect world as a good Christian and everything was supposed to go like this, A, B, C, you know, all the way through. And it's just not, and it's not ever gonna, and what is she going to do? And I think the more we kept at that idea, the more human she became for us. And I think, look, I mean, I, I couldn't play her if I didn't find something to love in her and, and, you know, even though she's completely different than me, and I mean, like, night and day, um, <laughs> um, I still think I identify very much with her fear of change and her love of her children. And, you know, I'm not a parent myself, but I, I completely can identify with her terror. I want to talk about um, one scene that Wembley mentioned a little bit earlier when Megan is at the PTA meeting. The discussion of who needs to bring what snacks comes up. And as Megan is talking about snacks to bring or what not to bring, it just very clearly becomes not about snacks anymore. We can play that clip right now. It's one of my favorite 
parts of the show. Oh, so tedious. Pay attention to me, special allergic person, me. I identify as, I'm sorry, but there was a time when people were just normal. You know, just. <laughs> Which also, that is such a brilliant That's little a pretty cut, cut and transition yeah. in between. I just love that so that much. But work. like, like what on earth are are her fears around her and her family veering outside the bounds of what she considers to be normal? Because for a second, it starts to get a little, starts to get a little personal to her. This is the, the the replacement, if you will, for or the stand-in that for her, the situation with her son, and it and it just balloons for her into this issue of like, you know, well, I guess we got to get some red carrots and some purple carrots, and we got to get you know, and you're gonna be bi, and you're gonna be, you know, trans, and you're gonna be, you know, and I guess we're all just deciding now because she can't wrap her head around it. Because as I say before, you know, when you have a system for life, a system for living, and you require that system in order to help make the world manageable. And I think that's a big part of the, of evangelical life, of being an evangelical Christian is that you, you need rules that keep you from spinning out. And when that's taken away from you, it, it can be very daunting and very, very scary. Yeah, and there's something, too, about, again, it goes way back of insisting that it's a choice, not a being. Megan, in some ways, you know, for her own survival, mentally sort of has to keep latching on to, well, it's a choice, it's a choice, it's a choice. You're going to get over it, like you were saying, Martha. You know, you're going you're gonna to grow out of it. This is just a phase. This is a trend. Exactly. We had some really fun, I mean, I think we wrote this, the backyard scene with... <laughs> with Megan and Patrick and Joe, what, dozens of times. I think just because, like, we were so, we were having so much fun in the many different iterations of her yeah. saying, "You yeah, what, so, so if you're bi, just choose the woman. Right. You know, which is sort of um, exactly what Z was talking about. And, and really this delightful way that Megan is spinning out, you know? Yeah. She clearly is having trouble in that scene in particular in the backyard, there's just something in her that is, it's just killing her that the other people in the room are not giggling and laughing at her little, um, her little punch lines that are just these points. She just wants everyone to agree with her and no, not even her husband is, is on the same page as her in this moment. It's, I think, just driving her absolutely crazy. It's and driving her up a wall. <laughs> it is driving her up a wall. But also I think in that, when we get into that scene, I think that she's not even conscious of what she's doing. Yeah. She doesn't realize that she's just horribly offended yes. Patrick and Joe. She doesn't realize that she's, you know, she's just, you know, and when Joe challenges her, mm -hmm. I love that we cut out of the scene right there because I don't think there's anywhere to go with that. Exactly. You know yes. what I mean? She would have found a way to change the subject anyway. She would have. And and the the bottle did it for her. But let's right. let's go ahead. Let's play that clip really quick. I have a feeling that Nathan likes a little drama. They all do. They all like to say, I'm this today, or today I'm that, you know, and have all their friends comment and put likes on their posts and whatnot. But half the time, they don't even know what the words mean. My point is that I know my son and I know what will make him happy, right? And that is all that I want for him. It's his happiness. With a woman. <laughs> Cue the broken bottle. There, <laughs> there's a couple of things I want to talk about with this scene. And the first one I want to know from Martha and Shar. Which, do you have, like, some specific parent-child relationship that you use to drive this storyline? That, that Whether that's something you've seen on television, it's in your personal lives. What are you tapping into? Uh, Me? <laughs> honey, we're well, going I there. didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have parental experience with with you know with a megan per se i mean you know i'm a child of the 70s so we were we were just like cotter children you know but i mean 
my real interest in in Megan is I you know I've used the word compromised, but I'm so continually fascinated by people who are profoundly compromised and you know what this does to one's entire life in terms of the rules that this person must lay out in order to walk the line of what this person thinks is the truth i think that's the fun of really exploring this character as a writer is that you really have to weigh every word in how is she supporting both supporting the illusion that she has of herself while at the same time being someone that we can all really see through, it becomes this sort of life or death struggle to not be exposed. And so she's desperately trying not to be exposed for, you know, Patrick and Joe calling her a bigot or, you know, it's like it's like to keep this civilized lid on these really dangerous feelings for her is, is a minute by minute struggle, I think. It's going to boil over. Well, and I love I love us also just witnessing the devastation that Nathan feels when he's overhearing this conversation. You really get the feeling that there's just there's no place for him to turn to be understood except for this extraordinary group of friends he has. Luckily, he has a great chosen family. So absolutely, I mean, I I I think that is a a great way to end this on a good note in regards to finding your family and knowing who's going to support you and lift you up. I'm so excited that we got to sit down and talk about this today. Thank you so, so, thank you so much, Martha. I learned a lot, guys. I learned a lot. (laughs) Fabulous. Well, thank you so much to Zelda. Thank you to Shar. Thank you to Martha for being here. We will be here in the meantime, every week, breaking down each episode with the show's creators writers and stars and it's going to be so much fun so stay tuned and once again thanks y'all for joining us thank you so much for having us thank you for having us generation the podcast is a production of hbo max and iHeartRadio, hosted by us Gigi good and wembley sewell the podcast is produced and written by phoebe hunter written and researched by Sierra Kaiser, and engineered, edited, and mixed by Matt Stillo. It's executive produced by Ethan Fixell. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Generation the Podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, be sure to watch the series itself on HBO Max. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. 